pray together. Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, your, your gospel. I thank you, Lord, for the message of salvation. Um, I thank you, Lord, for hope. Father, there's people in this room tonight, God, that that is straight away from you. There's people in this room that once knew you, was close to you, God, and uh, they're saved, but they're gone in the world, Lord, and, and they're convicted, and they've been living a miserable life ever since. They came here for a sandwich, but God, tonight you're going to get them. Father, I pray for that person in here that knows they're lost, knows they never have a relationship with you. They, they, they could care less about Christ. They could care less about the gospel. Father, they mock Christians, but tonight, God, you're going to save them. Father, there's people in here that have lost their children. There's people in here walking around with guilt the size of New York City. Father, I pray, Lord, that tonight you'll get them. I pray that your word will ring true, that heaven would break out on them tonight. There would be salvation in this place. Father, we ask, God, that you will move through me as I preach, that you'll move through the music, God, that you give us a eyes to hear and hear, ears, to, ears to hear and eyes to, eyes to see, God. Uh, we thank you so much for all you do. Thank you for, for being the, the God of creation. Thank you, God, for salvation, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you'll work and move through this place. Help me search my heart. Help me, God, with my sinful flesh, Lord. Um, help me remove all those things away. No pride. Father, I don't want to be exalted. I don't want to exalt the ministry or a denomination, God. I just want to lift up Christ. And Father, I pray that you help me do that. Thank you for the team of Freeway Ministries. Thank you for letting me be a part of the team. Thank you for everybody in this place that serves you and helps you, Lord. I pray that this moment tonight, there will be people who will be ushered into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. The title of the sermon is Learning How to Wait on God. It's in Genesis 16. We're preaching through the Old Testament. Uh, I don't know how long this is going to take. It could be like a long, long time. I really don't know if I knew what I was getting into. Uh, but here we are. Genesis 16. We're going to learn about a hero called Abraham and how Abraham learned how to wait on God the hard way. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right. That sounds pretty good. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. Genesis 16, verse 1. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. Hagar was her slave. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Sarai... Abram's wife took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. This, is some, this was an exchange. This was human trafficking, pretty much. You can have her. She's yours. He gave, she gave her to Abraham. After Abraham dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Verse 4, so he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. So Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. Now there's conflict. How, do you, how many know sin causes conflict? Verse 6. So Abram said to, said to Sarai, Indeed your maid servant is in your hand, do to her as you please. And when Sarai dwelt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by a spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her hand. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they may not be counted for multitude. Who else could do that but God? Right? For the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are a child, and you shall bear him, and his name shall be Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, and his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand shall be against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. 
Verse 13, if she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who, who, who sees. And he said, and she said, I have heard, I have, have I also here seen him who sees me. Therefore the well is called Beer Leroy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Barry. I said that wrong, so I'll keep going. Verse 15. So Hagar bore, Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abraham named him his son, who she bore Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. He said, man, that's a lot of words and a lot of text. Well, it's the gospel. The Bible says that all the gospel is profitable, right? Every single word of the Bible is profitable. People are going to be saved and changed and transformed from this book that's not outdated and doesn't need to be added to tonight. I'm telling you right now. How many people in here have, have had to wait on something? I have. I don't like to wait. I, I have a patience issue. Uh, the Bible says patience comes from tribulation. So pray for patience, you get tribulation. Right? But patience is the fruit of the Spirit. And so I want, I want to be patient. I need patience. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying don't pray for that. Don't get me wrong. But I cannot stand waiting. I don't like the grocery store. I don't like to wait in traffic. I don't like to wait for my family to get ready to leave. Uh, but tonight we're going to learn a lesson on God's timing. Perfect timing. God is always perfect in His timing. God made a promise to Abraham that he would have a son. And all the nations of the world will be blessed by his son. Abraham had a falling out with his nephew Lot. Lot would have been Abraham's heir. Abraham, God said, look up your eyes, Abraham. Genesis 13, right? He said, uh, Lot looked up his eyes. He walked according to sight. He went into the well-watered plains of Jordan. He told Abraham, lift up your eyes. He said, you got all this. Walk it now. Claim the promises of God. So Abraham did what he said. And, and then he said, uh, he said, I will give you as many descendants as the stars in the sky and the, and the sand on the seashore. Because Abraham was concerned about his heir. Who's going to get my stuff? Uh, it, it was a curse not to have children, people thought, right? And so God made Abraham a promise that in his son, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And so they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. See, Abraham had backslidden and went to Egypt. And he made a great comeback. He rescued his brother, or his nephew. Uh, he made some really good decisions. He walked by faith. He made a covenant with God. Things are going good. And bam! He listened to his wife. <laughs> Not always a bad thing, but it was here. See, Abraham and Sarah were both very old. Very old. And the promise of God seemed impossible because it was taking so long. Can anybody relate to that? The culture they lived in was a great mark of success to have many children. But to have no children was a mark of failure. See, the culture they lived in, concubines were used for childbearing. Uh, some would even, a concubine's a handmaid or a slave. Uh, some would even consider slaves as second wives with the same privileges that wives had. Listen to me. Not only was a concubine an option, but some men put it in a type of marriage contract that if the wife couldn't bear children, that he had a right to take a concubine. See, uh, no children was seen as a curse. If you read on in the Bible, in chapter 30 of the book of Genesis, you'll see Jacob and Rachel, Abraham's grandson, uh, had, was going through the same thing as Abraham, Abraham and Sarah. No, no children was a curse according to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 14. It was considered as a curse. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, and he told them, conditional, if you do this, I do that. If you do this, I do that. If you don't do this, I do that. And so part of it was you won't have any children. It was a curse to them. See, many of you in this room right now are going through something just like him. <laughs> You may not be going through the same condition as uh, wanting a child. Or you, you, you can't probably come to me and say, you know what, God, 
God came to me and made a covenant and, and He promised me all the nations of the world will be blessed. If you say that, I'll probably send you to the hospital. <laughs> but listen to me. Some of you have been waiting on God to move. Maybe at your job. Maybe in ministry. Maybe in your marriage. Some of you guys are hanging on to your marriage right now by a thread. Some of you want to give up. You got God's word here. And you got the world over here. And you don't know which way to go. Maybe you're getting advice from somebody you work with or a family member that's lost as the day is long. Telling you to do something contrary to what God's word says. I'm telling you tonight to wait on God and not give up and not let go. But hold on to the promises of God. I don't care how long it takes him to move. Because he will move. Maybe it's an issue with your kids. Maybe you've got problems at home with your children. You're holding on to the promises of God. The first thing I want you to learn about waiting on God is this. When waiting on God, always trust His Word. When waiting on God, always trust His Word. Listen, God made a promise. When God makes a promise, His promise is always yes and amen. Always. And so when God made a promise to Abraham, Abraham should have trusted God's Word. Genesis chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Uh, he said, look, you have given me no offspring. And God said, the one that comes from your own body shall be your heir. Who was he married to at the time? Sarah. He didn't have to do nothing. He didn't have to manipulate God's blessing. He didn't have to try to figure it out and work around and scratch his head and get advice. God said it. All he had to do was wait. Listen to me, guys. Abraham heeded the voice of his wife. 
He obeyed her. He did it. And it cost him. And today it's costing me and you. Because of Ishmael. Today it cost, it's costing lots of people right now. Because of his disobedience. Where do you think Muhammad came from? Ishmael. Because of this right here. Listen to me. It reminds me of his great, 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 great grandfather, Adam. Listen to what God told Adam in the garden. Genesis 3.17. Because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat cursed of the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Look at the that disaster sin cost Adam. And look at all the stuff that it cost us. Right now, today. People go to hell because of that. Listen, guys. Perfect fellowship destroyed. Sin entered the world. Death spread to all men. God's heart was broken. Your decisions, my decisions today are the same exact way. You say, I'm not going to be faithful to church. Guess what? You're going to backslide your tail right back into the same position you was in before you started coming to Freeway Ministry. As soon as you lack faithfulness. As soon as you stop giving uh, your time and coming here and serving and saying to God and praising the Lord and staying faithful to your church, listen, it doesn't have to make sense in your brain. It doesn't have to make you say, well, I want Jesus Christ to come to my house and have a coat and a smile and high five me and then I'll believe. Just because you can't figure it out doesn't mean God's not there. If you can figure it out, you'd be like God. You'd be worshiping somebody just like you. Listen, guys, some are holding on to God's word tonight, and you have people so close to you trying to do everything they can to get you to step away from what the Bible clearly tells you to do. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't quit. Keep waiting. Keep waiting on God. Keep holding on to the promises of God in your home, in your, with your families, with your children, in your marriage, at your job, in your service, in your giving. Don't quit waiting on God. This is for so many people in here tonight. You say, preacher, I'm saved and, and I'm living for Jesus and I'm in prayer and I'm in fellowship with God's people and I've been waiting and I've been waiting and I've been waiting and I'm telling you tonight to hang on because He wants you to wait. You say, I pray for this child, preacher. It's a good job. It's got benefits and, and it's got lots of money. Listen, God's saving you from ruining that job. Keep waiting. Hang on. God's faithful. Do the next right thing. Obey God. He's got you right where He wants you. Don't let the opinion of people sway you from God's word. Mm -hmm. Psalms 119, uh, verse 49. I love this verse. I found it. I just chewed on it for a long time. Uh, the people of Israel were backsliding, of course, because that's what they did, right? And uh, the psalmist wrote this about uh, how they did, how they were in their character with God after He would answer their prayers and after He would do great things for them. Listen to what He says, Psalms 119, verse 49. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. He's praying. He says, remember the word to your servant, God, which you caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. From verse, right verse, wrong place. Remember your word upon for your servant, for you caused me to hope. This is my comfort in affliction, for your word has given me life. Listen, guys, God's word is the most important thing to me. Uh, when I get up early in the morning, there's nothing that can keep me from I mean, getting in my Bible, learning from God, seeking God. I want to know God. I want to know Him more. I want to learn from His living, drink from the well, eat the bread of life so I can grow and be useful for Him, His kingdom. And God's Word tells me to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on God. We must hold tight to God's Word. God's word is greater than your circumstances. Abraham was in a rough place. I mean, let's keep it real. Come on. 80-something years old. You've been waiting on God's word for 10 years. You've been waiting on God's promise for 10 years. You've got a family. 
uh, you got a wife, you got servants, you got all these things, God's word promise, whatever, and, and so now you're waiting, <laughs> waiting for her to be pregnant, waiting and waiting, and then you start to doubt God's word. Listen, when you look at your circumstances, you will doubt God's word. If you look at your circumstances instead of the gospel, you will begin to doubt God's word. Who remembers Peter? Right? That's one of the best stories that really makes me think when Peter was on the water and, and, and the waves were crashing down on him. And, and they're in the middle of the sea. They've been in that same place a lot. They grew up in that area. They've been on that water. They were all fishermen. They got out and just in a matter of time, here comes the wave, here comes the wind, here comes the storm. Everything's crashing down on the boat. It's going this way, it's going that way. All night long. It seemed like nothing was ever going to change. They tried everything they knew. They tried all their fishing tactics. They tried all their naval tactics. They did everything they could. And then Jesus comes. And he's walking on the water to them. What happens? Nobody recognized him. You want to know why? Because no one was looking for him. Peter recognized Jesus Christ. He said, is it me? You know, Peter, Jesus says, it's me, Peter. It's me. It's Jesus. And, and Peter said, if it is you, Lord, call me to come. And Jesus Christ called Peter out of the boat. And Peter looked at Jesus Christ, man. And he took one step. And he took two steps. And he took three steps. And he's getting close to Jesus. But that's how many steps he said he took. But I'm telling you tonight, that's what I think. So he took step, and he took step, and he took step, and he got close to Jesus, and what happened? He looked away. What did he look at? The circumstance, he was in. He looked at the way, and he looked at the water, and he looked at the storm, and he looked at all his buddies back there on the boat, and he was too chicken to get out of the water, and, and he fell. It said he started to sink, and Jesus caught him, right? How close did he get? We don't know. I bet it's this close to Jesus. This close. And he looked away. He looked at his circumstances. And he fell. And Jesus grabbed a hold of him and took him to the boat. And as soon as his foot stepped on that water, off that, off that water onto the boat, the wave stopped. And what did he say to Peter? Why did you doubt? You take your eyes off Jesus Christ and you take your eyes off God's word and you look at your circumstance, guys, I promise you, you're going to fall. You're going to doubt. You're going to backslide. Because some of us have a circumstance that seems too great. Hey, listen, I know. I know what it's like. I've been on a I've been a needle jockey. I've been homeless. I've been in the streets. Nobody in my whole life and my whole family has ever been saved. Nobody I know in my whole life growing up has ever been to church. Only time we went to church is when they gave free groceries out. That's it. It's going to keep it real. Only time Jesus Christ was Jesus was in a cuss word. I've never seen a Bible in my house. Who could you, what happened to that guy? What if I kept my eyes on that circumstance? I got out of prison in 2009 with nothing. Not even $5 for a bag of chips and a soda at the Greyhound bus station in Kansas City, Missouri, man. What can happen from that circumstance? Dressed in a monkey suit. Didn't even have no clothes. Going somewhere I've never been. Sitting there looking at everybody eat. Hungry. What if I kept my eyes on that circumstance? Living in the Salvation Army in Springfield, Missouri in September 2009, everybody said, you will not find a job. We've looked everywhere. There's a recession. What if I looked at that circumstance? But I didn't. And I can take my finger and I can point to men in this room, the women in this room, that say, God is bigger than my circumstance. I'm trusting His Word. I'm obeying the gospel. He will move like He says He will in His Word. Charles Ferguson 
said this, if we cannot believe God when circumstances be against us, we do not believe God. It's hard. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything for you. You're in a dog fight with the devil. If you think for one minute your Christian walk's going to be easy, you need to pick your Bible up and start reading. Because you're in for a fight. It's not easy. It's hard. The Bible says narrow is the way. Compress the friction that leads to life. Few find it. It's a hard walk. It's worth it. It's a blessing. But it's hard. It's not easy. Don't let nothing get between you and your faith in God's word. You begin to doubt. Just like Abraham. Abraham looked at Sarah instead of God's word. You know what I've seen men and women come in this place? Do really good, wake on their girlfriend or boyfriend, get out of prison. As soon as their girlfriend or boyfriend gets out of prison, you think, man, uh, so and so is going to change because I'm changed and I'm seeking God and I love God and I'm praising God and I got a job, I got some money in the bank, I got a car waiting on me. Man, I, my kids are looking good, they're cleaned up, they're learning, they're not talking back, they're doing all right. Guess what? doesn't mean he or she's going to want to change. As soon as they come, what do you do? You look at them, follow them around. Right? Next thing you know, you're gone. Next thing you know, I'm reading about you on the news leader. Or seeing your picture on bus shops. Your kids are gone. Foster care. Why? Because you took your eyes off God's word and looked at somebody else. Just like Abraham did. Sarah looked at the culture. Sarah was worried about everybody else. What are they going to think about me? They got kids. God promised me. What am I like? Let's weasel around this. Let's figure something out. Listen, don't let culture dictate your walk with God. Just because your friends are watching pornography doesn't mean you can watch pornography too. Just because your friends are going to the bar and drinking it up, and you know, I don't have, I don't have an alcohol problem. I'm a drug addict. That's a foolish statement. What do you do when you get drunk? You make stupid decisions. The bar leads to the needle for a dog feed. Right? Don't let culture dictate your walk with God. Look to God's word. They both look to their, their bodies instead of God's word. Culture accepted men having more than one wife, but God never did. Culture calls things legal that are against God's law. Abortion! Same-sex marriage! Abusing their spouse, watching pornography, going to the strip club, spending all your money at the casino. I'm telling you right now, God's word says no, no, no. We stand on the promise of God. Are you looking to your circumstances? Saying to yourself, my circumstance is different. I'm going to do what I want to do. Are you looking at God's word? Listen to me, guys. Some of you guys have a very, very rough past. Amen. It's the truth. And you think God can't use you because of your past. You say, man, if you only knew what I did. Really? You know where I come from. God can't use me. My past. It's too bad. I've done too much. Show me that scripture verse. It's not in the Bible. You say, preacher, I'm in the same place I've been. Doing the same thing I've always done. You've lost everything. You don't have nothing. You're at the bottom. You say, preacher, I'm at the bottom. I lost it all. God can get more glory that way. Listen to me, guys. You lost your kids. You lost your family. You're in a rough situation. You don't feel like God can get you out of that circumstance. I'm here to tell you that's a lie from the devil. I'm going to tell you a short story, okay? I had a job placement advisor one time when I got out of prison. I joined a program called Prison Reentry Initiative Program by Mercy Goodwill. Uh, I was at the Harbor House. 
All I knew was Glenstone 5 and National 12, City Bus. And, and so uh, I got me some bus tickets, and I jumped on that bus, man. I was like a, uh, somebody from a foreign country, parachuted into a country I've never been to, with a landscape I never knew and a language I didn't speak, man. I'm from Jet City. I didn't know nothing about Springfield, right? And so I jump on that bus, and I travel around, and I go, I get dropped off on a, I said, take me to where the restaurants are. So they took me, and I jumped off the bus, and I knocked on every door. I begged for a job, and, and I went into a place called PRI, Prison Reentry Initiative Program. And, and uh, they said, we, we don't have any, uh, it was a grant-funded program. They said, we, you didn't sign up for prison. If you sign up for prison, you got grant money. They helped you. I didn't sign up for prison. They said, well, we don't have grant money for you. We can't get you nothing. I said, I don't want nothing. I just want to be a part of this. Can I come in? Can I be a part of it? They said, yes. And so I met a job placement guy, right? And anyway, uh, I sure hope he ain't still working there because this story is, <laughs> I won't say who he is, but I remember being a witness to this guy. He was very educated. He uh, helped people make resumes and, and helped people with their jobs, and he was sharp. And so I was telling him that I thought God wanted me to be a preacher. I was telling him that I thought God wanted to use me to reach people like me for the gospel of Jesus Christ, to find people who are like-minded with me and we can team up and we can do something for God and change people's lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember telling him that. I remember God had given me this faith. Yeah. Romans 12, 3. Right? Let each one know that God has dealt each person a measure of faith. Right? God deals it to us. Faith comes from God. It is not real for God. God gave me this faith. And I'm holding on to this faith in God, in God's word. And, and I remember, he seen my, I didn't even see my tattoos. I didn't even see them. I remember God giving me this faith that I didn't even see my criminal record. I remember God giving me this faith that I didn't even see my living situation. I remember God giving me this faith that I didn't even, I didn't even realize I was in the shelter. And I came to this guy, this smart, intelligent man, this guy and I'm feeling pouring my heart out. I'm telling him what God did for me in the book of self. I'm telling him God saved my heart. I'm telling him God changed me from a dope fee to a hope fee. I'm telling him what God did for my life. And it was like talking to a brick wall. And I remember this is what he said. My situation looked bad. And I'll never forget what this guy said. This is what he said. He said, yeah, John. Maybe one day you might even be able to join a church or start a Bible study somewhere. That's all he thought I will accomplish. Because he looked at my circumstances. But my faith in God told me how quick. Hang on to God's promises. Hang on to God's promises. Listen, you say I'm in a shelter. So what? Right. We're going to take a 15 minute break.